Well, thank you so much, Sarah. And uh, it uh, has been a wonderful pleasure for me to be here. And I can't uh, believe the third one is already upon us so quickly, seemingly. I thank Simon again for he heads up Crash, if you don't know. And he has been uh, just a wonderful energizer uh, of all of this. And we're all grateful to him. Uh, today's lecture is going to be about uh, women's rights to full political participation uh, with a view on where we are and uh, with a special focus on the role that women must and need uh, to play uh, in bringing conflicts uh, to an end as well. Women's political participation uh, has been ever so slowly improving and it's really very slowly. Uh, in the last 10 years, uh, the rate of participation in parliaments, for example, has only grown from 13% to 18%. Currently, there are fewer than 20 women heads of state or of government. Uh, clearly, all of this, and this is just scratching the surface, but the big part of the surface, uh, would indicate that we need to do much better, especially when women who have already advanced uh, have demonstrated, uh, many of them, extraordinary qualities of leadership. But let me put this another way. Women are one half of the population of the world, yet hold one fifth of the positions in national governments. Women are significantly outnumbered in parliaments, but as well as provincial councils, uh, missing from negotiating tables where a lot of decisions are being made uh, about uh, how conflicts should be solved and when will be solved. And wherever uh, these uh, places are where significant matters are being discussed and voted on, uh, it affects women as well, uh, affects their lives, their families, the state of their societies. Uh, and yet in many places they play next to, uh, next to no role whatsoever. I was in uh, the South Pacific uh, some months ago uh, where life is difficult at best. And I was meeting with uh, women both from uh, civil society as well as uh, the private sector, there were so few from government. Uh, and they came from across some 12 islands, some of them quite remote. And we were in Papua New Guinea, which is beset by all kinds of challenges. And at the time, there was only one woman in the parliament uh, in 109 positions. And she was retiring with no sense that there would be uh, another woman following her. And they recognized the need, and consequently some had introduced some legislation to add 22 reserve seats uh, for women in the PNG parliament. And it never made it through. Now, why should we care? whether it's in the PNG or it's any other place. Well, for one, democracy without the participation of women is a contradiction in terms. I have mentioned in previous lectures the annual gender gap report that the World Economic Forum does. And while they measure how wide or narrow the gap is between men and women in a given country, one of those me measures is on political empowerment. And it, of, it is one of four indicators, and it is the one in which women, as they have plotted this over many years, have made the least progress. And that holds true uh, because it happens to be the reality and it is closely looked at in any number of other studies as well. When women are discriminated against in the political arena, their experiences, talents, perspectives are also shut out of political decision making, out of democracy, out of prospects uh, for the kind of world we want to see, 
And I think as a result, we're all shortchanged uh, by that. The World Bank uh, has a study that shows that in higher level government positions, as more women attain those levels, corruption goes down. And this seems to be true particularly in democracies, uh, but it is no less significant because uh, corruption is a, a very big problem that uh, besets governments around the world. I have seen firsthand uh, the difference women make uh, when they are empowered politically. Thanks to a quota that was adopted some years ago uh, in India, today there are over a million women uh, in the lower levels of government, uh, the village panchayat level, the, the city the municipal council levels. And I remember being in India 15 years ago or so as this was slowly uh, beginning to take root. I was with a group of parliamentarians, mostly male, and they were telling me how it wasn't going to make any difference. Because, of course, the women would be in these positions, nominally, but they would be controlled by their husbands or others uh, in the village or in the city. And they, they really made very little of it. Well, what's happened in that interim has been quite extraordinary. It has been called the silent revolution in democracy in India. Uh, there have been any number of studies done now, mostly academic studies, that show a direct correlation uh, to women's leadership in these positions and extraordinary commitments to and application of resources uh, to improvements in the community. Or to drinking water, to sanitation, to education, to health, the kinds of things that really make a difference in people's lives. Uh, and where measurements were done as to what happened in many of these places in the past, uh, they were fraught with a lot of corruption, monies didn't make it into the, the public uh, sphere uh, in terms of improvements. Um, and this has been a rather remarkable change. And I have had the experience over the last few years of meeting with some of these uh, women, some in Rajasthan, some in Chennai and other places, and to go out into the areas where they are working and to hear their stories of how tough it's been. Uh, because today, obviously, women aren't just in the quota positions. They are running in extraordinary numbers in non-quota uh, for non-quota seats. And, and it has not been easy for them, and they will tell you what they're up against. But then you see uh, how, uh, how they feel uh, in terms of the achievements they have been able to make possible, and the response they get from the community, and the respect they get uh, for the kinds of changes that they have made. Several years ago, I was working with a group of women from Kuwait uh, which up until fairly recently uh, had not the right to vote nor run for office. And one of them said, we don't want a skim milk democracy anymore, we want a full cream democracy. Mm -hmm. And rightly so. These were extraordinarily competent women. Uh, I had the privilege of working with them as they were trying to figure out how can we make our case uh, to the people better that we shouldn't be sidelined from this process. And I took um, several of them to Capitol Hill where our Congress people are, and we brought uh, two legislators, uh, both women from the two top political parties, and they were um, explaining <coughs> how they had come together, which often happens even from disparate parties, uh, come together disagreeing on a lot, but agreeing on the kinds of things that, as women, they could persuade their male brethren and really make progress on issues. And it extended from health measures to Title IX, which has opened public resources to women uh, in athletics in America's colleges and universities, uh, to a range of other education and employment concerns. 
And they were laying all of this out. And shortly after that, uh, one of the women came to the State Department to speak about uh, what was happening in Kuwait and how they wanted to bring about change. And she said, you know, I must tell you about my experience today. She said, here I am. I'm a PhD professor in a top university. I have a wonderful family. Frankly, I have everything in life one could ever want. But I don't have the right to vote, and I can't stand for office. And I feel so compelled uh, to try to do everything I can to move the needle on that issue in my country. And she said, today I had this experience where I was up in your Congress, she's telling this group, and I met with these legislators and I saw what they had been able to achieve. And I kept hearing this inside of myself. Imagine if we can achieve that, what a difference we could make in our own country. And it was rather poignant uh, to work with these astoundingly successful and impressive uh, women. And they were struggling with what their message should be, because obviously they weren't having in, any impact in getting enough votes uh, to be able to stand for office and have the vote. And we took them to a group of uh, message gurus. Everything is the message today, and certainly political campaigns refined their message. And these Americans said, we don't know what works for your country, but here are some of the kinds of things you should think about. And the women went home, and they told us some weeks later that they had come up with what was going to be their, the banner under which they would wage this new iteration of their effort. And it was the future of Kuwait. No longer just women's rights, but the future for their country. What kind of country did their, what kind of future did their country want? Did it want to embrace the young people? Did it want to embrace women and men? Did it want a better future? And they were able to, after great efforts, persuade a majority uh, to, to do uh, what obviously was the right thing. And uh, it didn't come easily even after that. They won the right to stand for office, but it wasn't until four years later uh, that four of them were elected. And if I remember correctly, three of the four uh, had their PhDs. So uh, it was an extraordinary struggle, and in many countries this goes on. Now, there are a lot of inhibitions besides not able uh, to crack that really tough ceiling uh, that is imposed, it seems, in the political sphere. I have a friend who says it's not a glass ceiling, it's not a sticky floor, it's a thick layer of men, and you just can't get through. <laughs> and breaking through has, has obviously not been easy. But there are several reasons besides that hold, and one is women are less competitive on money, and unfortunately, Money is the mother's milk of political campaigns, and in some, it has come to the point where it is uh, almost scandalous, if not scandalous, uh, that there is so much money that is now uh, powering uh, these efforts. And in the United States, in response to this uh, problem, one of our uh, political parties, a, a group of people associated with the Democratic Party, uh, put together an entity called Emily's List, which stands for early money is like yeast. Uh, that if you make small contributions from lots and lots of people and bundle them together, it's like the yeast uh, that will enable your campaign to propel and particularly persuade the, the party leaders uh, that you have a lot of uh, wind at your back uh, to, ra to run a successful campaign, and you ought to be the nominee. Uh, and obviously this is but one way that uh, some have uh, worked through what has become a real, a real tough uh, hurdle uh, for a lot of female candidates. 
Uh, Emily's List and others provide the kind of training uh, to provide skills and um, effectiveness, uh, way, effective ways uh, to be persuasive, um, as well as to uh, engage in uh, help with uh, advertising and messaging and everything else that comes with it. But one of the um, also significant problems, particularly in parts of the world that have not enjoyed uh, much success in this category where women haven't, uh, is the lack of role models where you really haven't seen a woman in a significant position of power uh, and aspirationally it becomes tough thinking that it might even, even be possible. And so the more progress that can be made, uh, obviously the, uh, the greater the possibilities that others will be able to overcome those hurdles. And as I mentioned, one of the things that is striking in many places is when women do come together in the parliaments and the national legislative bodies, uh, as they may be from dis disparate parties and as they always are for the most part, uh, when they are able to come together, they become a very significant force. Uh, this has been true in the United States on a variety of legislation. Uh, it's true in Pakistan today. It's one of the great stories, positive stories out of Pakistan, in my view, uh, is to see what the women have done as they've come together uh, across all the divisions in that society to try to, uh, uh, to put a greater emphasis on issues that haven't gotten the kind of traction uh, that they deserve. So we can talk more in our, in our uh, conversational uh, setting after the, I get through these remarks about some of these impediments and what might be done to change, uh, to change the equation. Advancing women and girls is also about global security. And experience shows that uh, countries are much more peaceful uh, and prosperous where women do have uh, their full and equal rights and opportunities. Um, but there are dozens and dozens of active conflicts around our globe today. Uh, in fact, it's breathtaking. We may concentrate on one place or another, and that's bad enough. Uh, but if you were to circle the globe, you would find so many hotspots and so many places where lives are threatened. But women are largely shut out of any negotiations uh, that seek to end conflicts, uh, shut out of the decision-making process uh, that shapes post-conflict uh, reconstruction and decision-making. More than half of all peace agreements fail in the first five years. According to the World Bank, 90% of the last decade's conflicts occurred in countries that had already been in war earlier. So clearly we need to find a new way to address or a better way to address um, the ways that we go about trying to bring an end to conflicts and create some sustainable uh, peace and better futures for the people who are involved in these places. The UN Security Council, a little over a decade ago, adopted what is known as Security Council Resolution 1325, among the cognoscente, this is just referred to as 1325. It linked women to peace and security. Now, this is the Security Council whose main responsibility uh, are issues relating to the security of our world. Now, when they did this, they recognized that women have a key role to play at all levels of conflict resolution. They also recognized that in conflicts, particularly in these days, women suffer unspeakable horrors like gender-based violence, and much of the time, it is focused as a strategic tool directly on women. And so under 1325, the mandate is to also focus on ways to 
provide the protection that women greatly need. In many ways, it's more dangerous uh, to be a woman than a soldier today uh, in many of our conflicts. To this end, uh, the United States, like many uh, other countries represented in this room, finally, uh, in December of 2011, uh, President Obama launched the first ever United States National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. Uh, this was a roadmap of sorts uh, to accelerate and institutionalize efforts across the United States government uh, to advance women's participation in making and keeping peace. And that meant not just through our diplomatic efforts, but through our development efforts, through our military efforts. And the plan itself took almost a year to formulate. Uh, it was run out of the White House and it included all of our departments or what many of you would call your ministries that were related uh, particularly to those missions. Uh, this uh, also meant uh, that we would find new ways as we were undertaking those assignments, whether as diplomats or as part of the military, uh, whether it is in Afghanistan or Sudan or so many places in between, uh, that we would truly factor in uh, the considerations of women as we put together our strategies and our programs uh, to move forward. And this was true not just for areas in conflict, uh, but areas going through massive political transformations uh, like the countries uh, that have been going uh, through the Arab Spring. Some 30 countries already developed their own national action plans. We were Johnny or Jill come lately, as the case may be, uh, when we finally uh, put together our own plan a couple of years ago. And it is to influence the way all of the countries with a national action plan further peace and security around the world. But the promises of 1325, uh, regrettably, uh, remain largely unfulfilled. There are four areas uh, that are included in these national action plans that track uh, 1325. First, women and conflict prevention. Women are like canaries in the mines in many ways. The conditions in which they find themselves, uh, particularly those condi conditions where uh, there is the denial of rights uh, and um, the kind of uh, threats uh, to, the, uh, to their own security, are often the earliest signs of what's to come down the road uh, in terms of greater instability uh, and greater threats to security. Uh, so the subjugation of women in these circumstances, the denial of their rights, uh, is a threat to the common security. This is why we all who have participated in this process and are committed to it around the world find it that it is important uh, to uh, invest in those kinds of warning systems when these conditions begin uh, to present themselves and to mobilize the kind of support uh, that the people on the ground uh, need uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, protection and uh, efforts at real prevention before the situation gets worse. Uh, there's an N NGO that uh, called Inclusive Security that has uh, uh, is collaborating today with a number of governments uh, on something called the Resolution to Act, uh, so that before the worst happens, uh, resources can come into uh, places uh, in need uh, and enable those uh, resources to begin to have the kind of impact uh, that will um, ameliorate the conditions to a degree that it won't lead to worse situations. 
The second pillar is women's participation in peace negotiations. And that means from Northern Ireland to Liberia uh, and so many places in between uh, where women have indeed come together uh, and contributed to building a durable peace uh, that this becomes something that is less exceptional and more part of the way that uh, we should be conducting our negotiations. Less than 8% of peace treaties over the last 20 years have included women. Uh, whenever this is raised, the inevitable answer is there aren't qualified women to be part of these negotiating teams. Uh, and more and more people have put those lists together today to say it just isn't so. And yet we know that what happens in these negotiations is very critical uh, to what will happen in terms of the future of the countries where the women lead, lead their lives as well as uh, their families. It's been said that um, when negotiations were taking place in, in 2006 in Darfur, they were deadlocked over a significant period of time. And the reason that the negotiators, all men, were uh, deadlocked was because they couldn't agree to who should have rights to the river going forward. Uh, and this went on for some time until the women got wind of why there hadn't been any progress and, and why uh, there was this deadlock and they understood uh, what the cause was and they let it be, be known that there hadn't been any water in that river for some time. Uh, but if you're sort of not leading your life where these things matter every day, uh, they never get to the place where they need to get uh, in terms of really making the kind of difference. So it's important that the issues that women deal with every day on the ground where they lead their lives do influence the process uh, that takes place in a negotiation uh, so that these very issues, which are going to say a great deal about the future, are considered in ways that will indeed create uh, a peace that is sustainable. If life is to improve after a conflict has ended, uh, these kinds of issues will play a very critical part uh, in the future uh, resolution and creation of better times. Women usually cross divisions in societies. Uh, they uh, are honest brokers for the most part. They bring issues to the table where they have been involved, uh, ranging from uh, human rights to citizen security to jobs issues to, uh, to justice, uh, the kinds of things that absolutely have to be uh, resolved to have the kind of um, uh, future that uh, everybody wants to see possible. Now what shouldn't happen is what happened in Angola uh, when they were coming out of uh, their first civil war. And at the time, uh, there were peace negotiations that went on to formalize the end of the conflict. Uh, it, it, this took place in 1994. Uh, women were not part of the process at all. Uh, they were uh, completely absent. And my country supported these negotiations, as did others. Uh, they were part of the Lusaka Protocol that was finally signed and ended two decades of civil war in Angola. So the commission that was established to implement this protocol consisted of 40 men and not one woman. The women were also left out of any of the demobilization programs for the ex-combatants because of the way that combatant was defined it did not consider thousands of women who'd been kidnapped, forced to work as military cooks, as messengers, as even sex slaves. Demining efforts were focused on roads and failed to target fields, wells, and forests where women grew crops, fetched water, and gathered the wood, all of which was important to the functioning of the society. And following this conflict where rape was used as a tool of the war, the negotiators essentially gave each other 
amnesty for the crimes that they had perpetrated against the women. And that was essentially uh, what had happened. So perhaps it's no surprise that four years later, uh, war began anew uh, in Angola. And a um, man I've come to know very well, who was the US ambassador at the time, uh, said that, as he kept saying, don't you think we should have the women uh, present in these decisions? He was told, oh, they'll be mainstreamed over the long term. Well, whatever the definition of mainstreaming was, uh, there was no uh, ability for them to have the kind of impact they could have had. Now, on the other hand, in Liberia, you, you saw a, a different situation. Uh, another country racked by horrific conflict uh, over a long time. It was there that very simple women, uh, as Ellen Sirleaf Johnson calls them, Johnson Sirleaf calls them the, the market women, uh, they were and became a network for peace. Uh, they marched, they pushed for peace talks, uh, they created all kinds of um, uh, advocacy efforts to say essentially enough already uh, we really need to come to a place where we stop uh, the conflict that is tearing this country apart. And when the negotiations finally took place, and this has all been recorded in the documentary Pray the Devil Back to Hell, which some of you may have seen, uh, the women surrounded the discussions of the headquarters where the negotiators were uh, in these discussions and basically sent the message that nobody would be able to leave because there were hundreds and hundreds of them that surrounded uh, the building until they in fact had made the kind of agreement that would begin to uh, change the life of the people uh, in Liberia. Uh, and while the course has been difficult going forward, the peace has held uh, and uh, was it two years ago the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded uh, to two of the women who played an, a very strong role uh, representing so many others uh, in Liberia. In Northern Ireland, a uh, place close to here, uh, the women also uh, played a, uh, a very pivotal role, and this is one that I uh, know firsthand because uh, like the UK at the time and uh, the United States was very involved in trying to push uh, peace forward in Northern Ireland. And what had happened there over the years is that the women began to come together, uh, really both sides marginalized, both sides suffering from the deaths of their husbands and their, uh, their fathers and their brothers, all bearing the same consequences of a conflict that had gone on too far, too long. Uh, and they began to come together and talk among themselves about what should be done. And they didn't organize initially over bringing the end to the conflict. They over organized over the things that they had in common. And one of the first things they told me at the time was that the price of milk was going to be raised for uh, the, the milk that children got in school. And no side, none of these uh, women who were not, who were certainly not well off, felt that they could uh, afford that in addition to everything else that they were up against. And so they came together to, uh, to ensure that that didn't happen. And in the process built an infrastructure of community organizations that uh, still lasts to this day, uh, that includes what represents uh, both sides and a place where a lot of, of the problems that communities have to grapple with uh, have been addressed over um, many, many years. Now the women uh, in the process that began to go forward uh, were viewed as marginal to ending any conflict. They were viewed as marginal to economic activity uh, in Northern Ireland as well. Uh, they were shut out of the political system, and several of them came together and organized the Women's Coalition, which is, was for the time an all-women's political party, 
Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. There are women now in, I think, all of the political parties in Northern Ireland. But at the time, they played a very significant role. And because of the way the peace process was set up, they managed to get a vote that enabled them a seat at the table. And that's how the women in Northern Ireland had representation uh, in the process that ultimately led to the Good Friday Accords. And it was not an easy, uh, easy situation for them. Uh, at one point, President Clinton uh, would bring the political leaders from Northern Ireland to the White House every St. Patrick's Day uh, as this peace process was unfolding with a lot of bumps in the road. It was going forward, then it was pushed back, and then it would start to go forward again. And one of those St. Patrick's Days, I got a call from our uh, security people, national security policy people, not, uh, not guards, but the policy people, and they said, oh, uh, is there any possibility that the First Lady, Hillary Clinton, could meet with um, the representatives of the Women's Party because somehow the representatives of all the male parties got in to see the president and had meetings with the president and we forgot about them. And, you know, just five minutes, five, ten minutes, that will do it. Do you think that they can get in? And I said, well, we'll see what we can do. And of course, Hillary Clinton met with the women and it was a meeting that ran some two hours. And they told her everything that had been going on, how they had uh, made their way into the negotiations, how difficult it was, the kinds of uh, treatment that was um, something they had to live with uh, that was really what you would not call uh, the kind of uh, treatment we would want to give each other. And they said uh, to her, we really need, we need help. Uh, you know, in your country, you've got all kinds of NGOs that work with other organizations, work within the country to uh, help um, citizens, no matter what they're trying to do to grow their expertise. We need that sort of thing. And that really was the beginning of many years of engagement with the women in Northern Ireland uh, to, to validate them and the work that they were trying to do and provide the kinds of supports that they wanted so that they could make the difference uh, that they did make. And in the process of this meeting, they were all about to go into the big uh, St. Patrick's Day celebration. And the women said to, uh, uh, there were two women, one a Protestant, one a Catholic, representing the political leadership of the women's coalition, both sides. They said to the First Lady, uh, are you planning to say anything? And she said, well, I hadn't thought about it. I suppose I could introduce the president. And they said, well, um, you might want to say something. And she said, would it help you? And they said, yes, it would help. So she went in front of this enormous gathering of diplomats, people from Northern Ireland, from Ireland, the UK, et cetera, lots of activists in the peace movement, and talked about the struggles and the importance of women's participation in Northern Ireland. The words got a thunderous applause. There were a lot of women in the room and that may have been one of the explanations. Thunderous applause. And when the women got back to Northern Ireland, they said it began to change. All of a sudden they were validated. They were held up. They were acknowledged in that kind of rarefied company uh, that it was important what they were trying to do. And for me, this was a lesson of how important it is to, to constantly uh, support people who are doing that kind of hard work uh, to make peace uh, wherever it's occurring. Uh, the Good Friday Accor Accords, uh, of course, uh, were finalized. Uh, the women were a part of that process. History will record. Uh, that they put many issues on the table that probably would not have gotten on uh, had they not been there in terms of human rights, in terms of uh, justice, prisoners, uh, youth, etc. cetera. Uh, and when it was finally agreed to, it had to go to a referendum. 
And that's again where they really, really put their heart and soul into persuading their fellow people uh, that these Good Friday Accords uh, should be adopted and that it would mean a better future uh, in Northern Ireland. And they didn't have a whole lot of help uh, in that process. Uh, but the rest is history. Uh, these things are never as neat as they need to be. There's recidivism that occurs uh, from time to time because the making of peace is not something that is a, uh, a process uh, that doesn't but have to be worked at every single day. Uh, but I think it is an example, uh, a wonderful example, of the difference that women can and should be allowed to make in the process. The third pillar I want to mention of 1325 is the protection of women. Uh, they are rarely the cause of conflicts, but more often than not, bear the consequences of the combat. And when women are attacked as part of a deliberate and coordinated strategy, as in the case today in the DRC, in Congo, in Sudan, and other places, the glue that keeps a community together begins to dissolve and large populations are displaced uh, and destabilized and the armed combatants achieve their goals in the process. Uh, this security for women must not be separated from the overall security of a country, and in fact, it can't be separated. Sexual violence is occurring on a scale that is hard really to comprehend. It is so massive. Uh, in a place like the DRC. I traveled there with Secretary Clinton and I made a subsequent trip. And it is a place where these crimes uh, are rarely prosecuted, where impunity uh, is uh, what is the norm. It goes unchecked. Uh, and we heard over and over how difficult it is uh, to lead your life, even to do those very simple tasks as have to be done, as girls often get uh, assigned to do, uh, to fetch the water, to gather the firewood, uh, because often the, those are the times when they are in those movements uh, that they are most at risk. And one of the things that happened uh, as a result of a convergence of efforts uh, in the DRC was to offer a, uh, a resolution at the United Nations to enhance uh, 1325, uh, which is a resolution on sexual gender-based violence, to have a special representative of the Secretary General uh, deputized with focusing on this issue, uh, as well as to have a rapid deployment team of experts uh, to work with governments to strengthen the rule of law, to prevent impunity, and address needs of victims in this prevention stage when there is some chance of keeping the worst from happening. The protection of civilians has to be improved in many places. Uh, peacekeeping troops, um, military and police as well, uh, have to have the expertise to prevent and respond uh, to this kind of violence. There's a great need for uh, better training. There's a need to have more women engaged as peacemakers, uh, in, as peacekeepers, uh, as well as in, in the um, uh, police forces. Uh, and it is important to constantly work at those three Ps, prevention, protection, uh, and prosecution, because without the prosecution, uh, with impunity, this just goes on uh, in a vicious cycle that uh, is, is without uh, end. I, I want to say, since I'm here in the UK, that um, the government here uh, is playing a, a really significant role on this issue. Um, there is an initiative today to prevent sexual gender-based violence in areas of conflict. Uh, that is an initiative of the uh, government here. Uh, the UK has the uh, presidency of the G8 uh, this year. Uh, 
Uh, the UK has put this issue on the priority list for the discussions of the G8, and they've committed significant resources uh, to this, this effort. Um, currently, there are some 70 members of the uh, UK team of experts posted along the Syrian border uh, and providing the kind of critical support that is desperately needed on this issue. Uh, a few weeks ago uh, at Georgetown University where I am um, heading up a new institute on women, peace, and security, we honored the Attorney General of Guatemala, uh, the Attorney General Pazipaz. Paz. And she is one of these exceptional people who is trying, uh, with the support of her government uh, and with an extraordinary prosecutorial team, uh, to begin to address the issues of violence that have a plague that society for a long time. They went through a 32-year civil war, and the vestiges of that war go on uh, in femicide uh, that is rampant, one of the worst uh, records uh, of many countries. Uh, in the kind of violence against women that takes place and, and frankly, in a justice system that hasn't worked. And what she and her team have done at great risk uh, to their lives is really try to begin to end the impunity, to make the justice system work, uh, and to give people there a sense uh, that a new day is possible all of these years after the Civil War. And there's never been a prosecution of anybody uh, involved uh, in the Civil War, uh, including uh, the, uh, the top leadership. And despite the fact that uh, the brutality and the murders uh, are something that uh, were stunning uh, in their magnitude and for which there has never been any accountability until now as cases are beginning to uh, be put together. And when she was asked, why are you prosecuting cases coming out of the Civil War, she said, because until there is accountability, until the people can believe uh, that justice is, can be rendered uh, in their society again, until there can be faith uh, in the system, uh, and until they can know for sure uh, that uh, these kinds of crimes uh, will be, uh, will be uh, served uh, by justice, there will not be the kind of change they need to see. And I was struck by this as I sat with a group of women one night uh, in Guatemala. They had all been uh, victimized uh, they were victims of violence. And the, the women in this uh, center that was devoted to trying to support their, uh, them and help them heal their lives, et cetera, had their cases adjudicated. And they said to me that they never believed there could be justice in Guatemala. But now, seeing it happen in their own lives, they realized that a new day had come and that justice could really work. Uh, so these are some of the kinds of uh, things that have to be done uh, to address uh, the, the kind of violence uh, that has gone unchecked and unaccountable uh, and uh, never addressed in a, a system of justice. And the last pillar uh, of 1325 is that women need to be actors in post-conflict reconstruction. Uh, and that is from economic development to humanitarian assistance, uh, to play a role in its design, to, uh, to be heard on what is needed, and to begin to have the kind of uh, resources to be able to knit a society uh, back together. And their role in all of this uh, really struck me one night when I was with a, a group of uh, women in Kabul in Afghanistan. And before the discussion began, one of the women said, 
Stop looking at us as victims and look at us as the leaders that we are. And I thought to myself, you know, she is right. They have been victimized in ways that none of us can imagine. Uh, but in other ways, we have only looked at them through the prism of that suffering and that victimhood and have not seen them as the critical actors that they must be uh, as their country goes forward, uh, particularly in this time of transition uh, when the discussion is about reconciliation, reintegration, uh, what the outcomes will be in Afghanistan. And the women are very fearful because they have made great strides over the last decade. 25% uh, are in the parliament, uh, thanks to a quota, but they are demonstrating their leadership. They run for provincial councils. I happen to have been there during an election. You could have thought, but for the, uh, the, the place that it was uh, like any place at election time with posters everywhere and uh, lots of uh, discussion and debate. They have uh, demonstrated how critical they are uh, to what will happen in the future. And all of us, for our part, who've been involved uh, in, in that conflict and trying to bring about uh, a better future for the people there, uh, have established red lines uh, that for reintegration, among the red lines is respect for the Constitution. Uh, and that means protecting women's rights, which are chiseled in that Constitution. But how all of this turns out, none of us knows. Uh, but that's why many of us, many of the governments involved in Afghanistan, uh, have pushed for women's participation in all of the international conferences, in all of their local meetings of the Loya Jirga, in all of the ways uh, that are now being put in place uh, for a peace process, uh, including the High Peace Council. Because if they are silenced or marginalized, if they are sidelined in ways that, as they greatly fear, that deals will be made about their future without their being a part of that process, it is highly likely that any potential for peace there uh, will be subverted. And their role in Afghanistan, as well as the role of women in the Arab, so-called Arab Spring countries, <coughs> is another example of uh, why the partic their participation makes all of the difference. You know, in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, the women stood shoulder to shoulder uh, with men in hopes of bringing about self-determination and dignity uh, and a better life uh, in their countries. And yet they are finding uh, now that their own rights are being jeopardized and no one knows there either uh, what the future holds. Uh, in Egypt, women have sustained uh, much violence. Uh, they've been humiliated in the streets where they once stood shoulder to shoulder uh, with the men to bring about the revolution. Uh, there's been a troubling pattern of their being shut out of politics uh, by the military, by the political parties, uh, and with threats even that the uh, steps they had made that were progressive in the past will somehow be jeopardized. Uh, Tunisia is in the process of trying to finalize a constitution. Uh, some 25% of the participants in the Constituent Assembly were women, were elected because of the process uh, that was set up. And there was a huge battle several weeks ago over complementarity versus equality, where some were attempting to take equality out of the Tunisian Constitution, which had been there for decades, uh, and instead insert a, a different uh, standard. Uh, and the women were able, with all of the good men supporting them, to beat that back, but nobody knows there uh, what will happen going forward either. So in all of these places, uh, this matters. And I just want to end uh, on a note that I have mentioned in the previous lectures as well, uh, which is the issue of data. 
how important it is to be able to create the record, the oral histories, uh, the evidence of how important it is uh, to document uh, women's role in these circumstances, uh, both as the right thing to do, uh, that women are disproportionately affected and they deserve to participate in the decisions that affect them, that are being made as the process in their countries goes forward. And also that it's the smart thing to do because it does lead to a durable peace or better prospects for a durable peace. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, the kind of research and work that goes on here in Cambridge uh, writ large, uh, collaborating with others, whether uh, at the Georgetown Institute or our efforts to at least map out where uh, all of this data is today uh, is certainly a welcome process. I had a discussion with some of the uh, graduate students this afternoon and uh, one of the young men there was working on the role of NATO uh, in 1325 and women, peace and security and I'm sure that uh, a lot of what he will uh, be able to create in terms of a record uh, because he's been able to interview so many people involved in the process uh, will also serve the greater good in the long term. And let me just say finally, since this is the last of uh, the three lectures uh, that uh, I have been able to uh, make here, uh, that uh, each and every one of you uh, I'm sure, is um, laying a foundation in some way for the kind of world uh, that we want to see, uh, one that uh, is free from some of the most devastating human rights abuses, a place where uh, violence against women has no place, and where men and women are truly equal, and where justice and peace are a reality. This may be viewed as the nirvana uh, that one aspires to, uh, but it is happening every day. There are people on the front lines every day uh, trying to uh, create uh, better conditions uh, for the people with whom uh, they live and work and for the likes of all of us who uh, really are affected by what happens every place else. So our work is far from done, but I believe that uh, we'll continue uh, to develop effective ways to address some of these persistent obstacles that we've been discussing over these three lectures uh, that have uh, held back the advancement of half the world's population. Uh, because I think if we don't work uh, at addressing these issues, uh, gender equality has been called the great moral imperative of the 21st century, but it is also the most important strategic uh, smart way of going forward on, in grappling with some of the toughest issues. And I think if we don't do everything that we can do, we will hold back one of the most powerful positive forces for shaping the globe. Thank you.